So the second half of the meeting now, thank you again to Susie for the great talk. And um, actually it's very topical because um, there is an event on its way to um, Earth at the moment, which we'll uh, have an update on in a moment. But we're gonna start, I think, with, with Robin, um, with Robin's uh, update about the night sky. Hi everybody. Right, let me go through the minefield a sharing screen. I had trouble sharing the moon video, but uh, let's hope it works this time. Okay, let's try what I can do. Here we are, PowerPoint. Oh, right, I haven't started the PowerPoint itself yet. Let me do that. Right, there we go. That should work now when I share screen. Let's try again. PowerPoint slideshow, there we go. That looks that looks like it should be work. Right. Okay. Good. Thanks very much. Okay, now what's up in the sky? Now what I need to do is move slides on. There, that's working. This is a photograph I took last night at uh oh about uh half past six or thereabouts, I can't remember the time. And there are a couple of planets visible in this. It's not a great photograph, but it shows you what the sky will look like. Over to the left here we've got Jupiter and there just about to dodge behind that cloud is Saturn and way down here over to the uh, lower right is Venus now Venus has been in the sky believe it or not it's undergoing its uh, its apparition for this this year it's in the it's an evening apparition it's to the east of the sun so it should be in the western sky after sunset, but we haven't seen it. So what's going on? Uh, up till now, it's been almost invisible. And it is there. Currently, it is about 50% phase. So it is actually, I think it was yesterday, it was at its maximum elongation from the sun. And yet it's hardly visible. And hopefully the next slide will show you what's going on. This is the view of the planetary positions as it will be at 5 p.m. Now that's remember that the clocks are going back tonight. So this is equivalent to 6 p.m. tonight and it won't change very much. And you can see there's Jupiter and Saturn. And this is the angle of the ecliptic, the line along which all the planets uh, are to be seen. And there's Venus. And you'll see that it's actually quite a long way from the sun. During its, uh, during its apparition, uh, its, its orbit from the uh, from the sun, it first of all first of all starts out as a tiny dot just to one side of the sun like that. Then it moves out to uh, to its greatest elongation from the sun. Then it starts to turn around and then it goes back again. And as it comes back again, it starts to become a thinner and thinner crescent. Just currently, it's roughly at half phase. To be honest, I haven't had a look at it. As you saw, it's very low in the sky not ideally placed for telescopic observation. But at the moment it is at its greatest elongation and yet it's so low and you can see why. It so happens that in autumn, the any uh, solar system phenomenon that appears in the autumn in the uh, just after sunset, it's actually very low in the sky because as you can see there, the angle of ecliptic to the horizon is very shallow. The reverse happens in the spring and events that happen in the spring, such as the elongations of the inner planets, Mercury and Venus, appear very high in the sky. And in 2020, we had an apparition of Venus in the first part of the year that had everyone saying, what's that bright star? It was really obvious, one of the best we've had for years. And it's followed by one of the worst we've had for years. Um, the last time we had an apparition of Venus as low as this, was back in 2003 and uh, they, they are fortunately not all that common. Uh, however, give, a, give it a go a couple of months and things will improve. Now there's the situation as we will see it in December, on the 21st of December, a good time to choose because that is the, uh, uh, th that is of course the solstice uh, when the sun, when the, the, the nights are as long as they're going to be and we can start looking forward to the uh, to the uh, summer coming along again. That's the, that's the optimistic way of looking at it. But you see, the sun is the same height as it was 
uh, below the horizon in the uh, as it is at the moment but venus is very much higher although it has actually it is on its way back towards the sun it's not as far from the sun yet it's much more visible and if you look at the sun uh, at venus around that time you'll see it's a noticeable crescent and as the year wears on you will find that even binoculars will show you the crescent phase of venus so this will be the appearance towards the in the in the next uh, couple of months and you'll get this lovely line of Jupiter, Saturn and Venus. And in fact, at that time, even Mercury, but uh, that, that is uh, not as easily visible. Uh, it's, it's going to be quite low in the sky, quite a challenge to observe. However, as Andrew was saying, Mercury is visible in the early morning. He's obviously an early riser, so he gets to see this. This is a lovely picture taken a couple of days ago by Paul Sutherland. If you wonder why Paul gets all the credits for photographs when I show them, it's because he sends them, send them to me. And what's more, he has a wonderful eastern horizon. That black darkish line you see there is not the edge of the frame. That is the sea uh, where Paul uh, lives in, in Warmer in Kent near Deal uh, between Dover and uh, Folkestone. It's uh, Dover and Ramsgate, beg your pardon. It, it, he's actually looking more or less to the south southeast and he gets a lovely clear horizon sea horizon and there was mercury in a lovely part of the sky just before the dawn that was about 623 and uh it went, when the clocks change of course it's going to be earlier in the the day so uh you, you earlier in the morning so you might not get such a good chance to find it and i can't resist showing the next photograph which paul took on the same occasion isn't that lovely? That's Arcturus on the same occasion, uh, just a few minutes later, taken with a telephoto lens, just a short exposure and those lovely clouds. That's a really beautiful photograph, isn't it? It goes to show that you don't need to have uh, long exposure photographs to take lovely pictures of the sky. These days, modern digital cameras can do wonderful things. And what's more, you don't necessarily need to be up there at night for hours on end. Uh, you can do short exposures as well with modern cameras. So there we go. This was due to Jupiter and Saturn uh, a couple of nights ago from uh, that's one of my photographs. And those again are uh, well placed for observation, not as high as we would like to see them. And they won't be getting much higher. This is if you're going to look at them, look at them in the next uh, next few few weeks, I would say, because they are going to be just about at their highest. They're past opposition now. And Jupiter there, uh, the one on the left, is uh, is the brighter Saturn the one on the right nevertheless you should be able to see details on them and well worth looking through telescopes if you can get them and they define the constellation of Capricornus for us there's Alpha and Beta Capricorni Alpha is the one that looks as a double star you can see it with the naked eye if you look carefully and you've got a good sky and the ca constellation of Capricornus Corners comes down like that and those two stars at one end um so if you've ever wanted to find the Capri constellation of Capricornus, if it is your sign, of course, we don't believe in star, star signs, but do we? But everyone knows what their their horological sign is. And if yours happens to be, um, sorry, the astrological sign, if you happen to be uh, a Capricorn, then that's where to look to find your constellation. And I don't believe you're suffering any better or worse uh, results as, uh, as a result of... Um, conditions as a result of Jupiter and Saturn being in your constellation. There's another object in the sky at the moment you might want to look at and it's a very much more difficult object to find. <clears throat> it's the, the well-known uh, comet which we refer to in colloquial parlance as 67P and you can see the rest of its name there, Churyumov Gerasimenko, which is uh, very rarely mentioned for obvious reasons. Uh, it's actually very close to the Earth at the moment, or very easily visible at the moment, I should say, not particularly close, but it is actually quite easy to find it as a faint object. If you are into comets, then it's about 10th magnitude, and <clears throat> you'll have to look online to find the positions of it. But uh, there it is in Gemini. Don't expect to look with binoculars and, and pick it out just like that with a little tail. It's not that easy to find but you can photograph it more easily. And I'm yet again indebted to Paul for sending a photograph. And 
Now there it is. This is when it was uh, just a couple of weeks ago, when it was near the cluster M35 in Gemini. And there's the comet, not particularly bright. Uh, again, this was taken from warmer and um, he gets darker skies than I do. He gets a better horizon than I do as well. But that shows you what can be done. Uh, this was on a star tracking mounting. So you do need a bit of effort to do that. And here's a close up showing the, uh, the, the, the comet there. It's, uh, it's actually quite a quite a small object just with a little tail there and so that is what you have to look for but nevertheless something well worth looking for and talking of comets is there's a, a, a new um, news story on the comet section website put there by Stuart Atkinson about Comet Leonard and you can see from its name Comet uh, actually it's Comet 2021 uh, A1 A1 means not that it's a particularly good comet. It's not in the A1 category. It means that it was the first comet to be discovered in 2021 uh, by um, a guy uh, called Leonard, uh, that's his surname, at Mount Lemon Observatory in the States. And it promises to be an interesting comet, uh, possibly naked eye visibility. But as Stuart says in his piece on the SPA website, if you want to find it, go to observing sections and then uh, scroll down to comet section and then news and you'll find his story about this as he says don't expect it to be the sort of thing that you could obviously spot with the naked eye just looking up at the sky oh there it is no it's not going to be as bright as that it's not going to be another hail bop or comet neo wise that everybody will spot it might actually reach reach magnitude four possibly magnitude two but nevertheless <clears throat> It's going to be in our skies and it's something that's going, to, going to be well worth looking for over in the northeast there, as you see, and that will be in about December. So keep an eye on Cobbett Leonard and see what you can uh, find of it. Um, it it's, we, we have to take comets as they come. Don't expect another one to come along just like another bus in a few minutes time. They're not all that regular and not all that easy to uh, to observe usually when they do come along, but make the best of what we can. <clears throat> Pardon me. Uh, coming meteor showers. Well, we get, uh, we, we have the, the several meteor showers coming up in the next three months. And usually what happens is because of the dates, one is a good or the other two are bad. And on this occasion, one is bad and the other two are good. And the, the Leonids, which uh, you may remember can be a very spectacular shower <coughs> on me um occurring in the middle of november about the november the 17th they have they're the ones that have produced the most spectacular meteor showers ever virtually back in 1833 1866 and 1933 and 66 uh this this is not in that cycle of really bright displays and we saw quite a lot in 2000 and 2001 as well. But on this occasion, the zenithal hourly rate is more likely to be around 10 to 15. And that is the zenithal hourly rate, which is the number you would see if the radiant were in the zenith right overhead and, the, uh, 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 and you had perfect observing conditions and you could see every meteor that appears. But in practice, you're likely to, you may see well, it's nearly full moon, so you may see none at all. But with the Leonids, it's always worth keeping an eye open. No particular dramatic expectations for this time, but keep an eye on them anyway, after all. <clears throat> and then we have the Geminids uh, on, um, oh, I haven't put the date there. That, that'll be about December the 14th. Um, and so December the 14th, just after first quarter in December. So very much greater likelihood of of being able to see them because of the darker sky about uh, 2 a.m the moon will have set and the radiant will be really high so look for the geminids the, the zhr again is listed as 150 so expect very many fewer but nevertheless about 40 out that's not bad 40 an hour um as long as you can wait up even with the uh, uh, just after first quarter moon you should still see quite a few earlier in the evening the the gemini geminid radiant is up um pretty well i think as soon as it gets dark so you should be able to see some so if you're not don't have the stamina to stay up all night 
then you can still uh, see some hopefully and the quadrantids coincide again with new moon on this occasion so good conditions those occur on january the third fourth um so back into the uh, then into the new year zhr maybe 60 maybe 200 uh, those are the figures from the uh, international meteor organization but uh, our meteor section director uh, mark mcintyre says expect 40 to 50 um and that's a, that's still a good rate now that doesn't mean to say you will see one every one and a quarter minutes or something like that again they're very much like buses they you, you may get uh, none from 10 minutes 15 minutes and then all of a sudden you'll see two or three this is what's this is this is just random appearance there's nothing there's nothing sinister about it they're not all waiting out there just until you close your eyes and then they'll put all the pier and all your friends see them and you don't <clears throat> so you just have to give it a long enough time and hopefully you will see a good number so that's what's coming up in the sky over the next few months um one thing that i would like to also to show and i'll just share another part of my screen hold on and that is, uh, I put out a newsletter about it earlier on, and that is the um, the, the possibility of seeing um, an aurora tonight. Now, this is the latest space weather uh, display. Let me just refresh the page, see if it's changed. No, there's the view of the sun at the moment, a couple of, of um, spots on the sun. And as Andrew was saying, there was a coronal mass ejection, which, um, which started on the a couple of days ago um on the 28th and <clears throat> you can see the burst acting there um to uh to what extent it's heading almost exactly from earth therefore it, it's you can see a lot of particles appearing um, on the screen there it should hit us sometime tonight at the moment let me just check my screen i looked at <clears throat> the aurora watch and it was still showing nothing much happening but if you scroll down the page maybe later on tonight <clears throat> you will see and, and refresh this picture here for europe uh, you, you will see the auroral oval and if it's looking bright green and you can see the uh, the value for kp which is currently quiet if it goes up to a much higher number then there's a good chance of seeing an aurora <clears throat> and therefore also on this site you'll see the spa website um, spa uh, advertisement there so have a look at space weather for an up-to-date view of what's going on and so with that i shall stop sharing my screen and hand back to andrew who may tell us more about what's what's been going on if he's got any up-to-date news about that thank you very much robin yeah so yes i'm keeping an eye um and actually the uh, the met office have a um have a, have a space weather forecast out um on their website so they um i mean this it was a very large solar flare an x1 solar flare um which was at 1535 um on the 28th of october um and so um almost immediately as robin was showing there uh, you get very fast particles from the sun which uh, which actually caused snow on the detector which uh, which was visible there um but the slower um coronal mass ejection is headed towards earth at the moment so the soho spacecraft which that um, image was from uh, or gif was from um you can you can see a expanding halo and so that is coming towards us um and um so sometime this afternoon or maybe this evening this will hit earth how effective it is we can't be sure yet because we don't know how um which orientation the magnetic field is in whether it's northward or southward that is very um critical we will know when it passes the spacecraft which are upstream of the earth so the ace and discover spacecraft which are upstream of earth and i believe solar orbiter actually is a little further upstream as well so we should get some better information about that that um uh quite shortly so the met office forecast um says a chance of aurora aurora sightings for northern uk um and um so that's the the possibility so minor to moderate geomagnetic uh, storms are expected uh but yeah so this could arrive any time from now so i'm i'm sort of keeping an eye it hasn't arrived yet um so the NOAA um uh, suggest an 85 possibility of a severe high altitude um, 
storm, which is a G3 storm in the, in the parlance. So, so worth keeping an eye and, um, uh, you know, something which uh, does happen every now and then. There was a Halloween storm in 2003. Some people might remember that. So it just happens to be around about Halloween. So it's nothing to do with the, the time of year, really. It's just when the sun decides to um, uh, dis, dis, decides to send um, an onslaught uh, like this towards the earth. So, so keep watching today. Weather's good. So hopefully um, there may be a chance of seeing something, especially in the northern UK. Uh, but yes, the Met Office website, you can, you can um, have a look at the forecast there. So thank you very much. Um, and uh, I've been trying to answer. So unfortunately, I've seen that there were some additional questions after um, Susie, which I believe has, who I believe has left. So I'm trying to um, answer those via text um, as I can. Um, and um, uh, if, if not, I'll be, we'll send those on to Susie. So, um, so thank you very much for, for the extra questions. Okay, any questions, any, any questions for Robin? Can't see any, uh, but uh, thank you very much, Robin, for the usual excellent um, summary of what's happening in the in the sky at the moment, and um, uh, that's great. So our next talk then is going to be Matthew Barrett, um, who's the Variable Star Section Director of the SPA, and is going to be talking to us about observing the night sky with binoculars. Um, so all yours, Matthew, thanks. Right, now I have to try and share my screen, see if it works. Can everyone see that? Mm, yes. Yes, we can. Yes. Yeah, perfect. All yeah. right. Excellent. So yeah, this talk is going to be about, you can see the night sky just with a simple pair of binoculars. So contrary to popular belief, you don't actually need a telescope to be an amateur astronomer. You can do a great deal of observing just with um, the naked eye or a simple pair of binoculars. So I thought just to set the scene, we start by talking about what you can see with the naked eye. Obviously, you can see the moon. The moon's a great object for, to look at if you're new to astronomy because it's big, it's bright, it's easy to find. And you can see loads of detail on the moon just with the naked eye. For example, you can see the dark areas here, what we call the mare or seas, because the ancient people used to think they were bodies of water. We now know they're frozen lava plains. And you can see the lighter areas as well, which are the lunar highlands, the mountainous regions that rise above the lunar mare, and you see craters as well, just the naked eye. These are impact craters because they have formed billions or billions of years ago for asteroids and comets raining down on the lunar surface. And of course you can follow the phases of the moon as well as it goes from new to full back to new again. You can also see the planets, five of the planets are visible with the naked eye. You can see Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter and Saturn. And you follow them as they go, as they slowly move across the night sky. You also see what we call conjunctions, which is when the moon and planets um, appear close together in the night sky. They'll be attractive things to look at. That's a photograph of the crescent moon there in Venus, which is often seen, either low in the east or low in the west. Just and uh, these conjunctions, yeah, can be very, um, very attractive things to look at. They easy, easily seen with the naked eye, even from light polluted skies. You see the stars themselves, of course. You can trace out the constellations across the night sky. See these, these constellations are patterns of naked eye stars. Um, often date back to the time of the ancient Greeks, so they symbolize um, figures in ancient Greek mythology. And you see, if, if you're living um, in the UK or anywhere north, in the sun, you can see knots of the clouds. These um, clouds that form high up in the Earth's atmosphere, in the mesosphere, the altitude is about 100, 120 kilometers. We think they're formed by uh, ice crystals crystallizing around uh, bits of uh, cometary dust. They're um, yeah, usually visible sort of low in the north around the time of midsummer. These there's a photograph of knots and clouds there. They're, they're sort of silvery grayish clouds here. These are normal clouds that form the lower part of the Earth's atmosphere, but these are the not and clouds. They're, they're, they have this wispy kind of appearance as well as a uh, silvery sort of color. But you see uh, meteors. Or shooting stars. Shooting stars can be seen on a clear night, but um, the best time to see shooting stars is during uh, what we call a meteor shower. As Robin said, there's a uh, couple of meteor showers coming up soon. So we've got the Leonards and the Geminids. So that's uh, meteor is sort of the best thing with the naked eye. You don't need an instrument to see that. If again, you may be very lucky to see an aurora. Again, Robin's already mentioned that um, you could possibly see aurora sometime in the UK. Um, usually, you have to see it go further north further south to see the aurora but um 
very occasionally raw can be seen sort from the southern UK and again that's best observed with the naked eye. And finally you can see comets. Okay, very occasionally comets visible with the naked eye do actually appear and that's a photograph of um, comet Neowise where I think it was visible in the uh, last summer and it's easily seen with the naked eye. But if you want to explore the night sky in greater detail then you definitely need a pair of binoculars. The advantages of binoculars over telescopes is that they're cheap to buy. Um, prices vary quite a lot. I mean, from about, you can get binoculars for under 50 pounds, more expensive ones are up to sort of 150 pounds. But usually, if you have about 50 pounds to spend, you could buy um, an excellent pair of binoculars for that. They're also very easy to use. They're very um, instinctive, very intuitive to use. There's no setup or assembly required. They have very low powers and they have a very wide field of view, which makes it very easy to locate objects in the night sky. Uh, one of the great challenges uh, beginners to astronomy have is trying to find things in the night sky. And binoculars make that very easy because virtue having these very uh, wide fields of view. And of course, they also use for other activities as well, such as uh, bird watching. So in any ways, uh, binoculars really the ideal start instrument for a would-be amateur astronomer. A lot of amateur astronomers you know, make the mistake of rushing out and buying a telescope. That's usually a mistake because a, they don't know what they're buying, and also when they get the telescope, they're not sure how to use it. But if binoculars, you see, you can build up a great deal of experience. That's probably the night sky, you become quite an expert in astronomy, all without the expense of hassle of, of buying a telescope. Now, how do binoculars work? Well, basically, binoculars think uh, consist of three parts. You've got the objective lens, which is lens at the front that collects the light. The bigger the objective lens is, the more the light the binoculars can gather. So therefore the fainter objects you can see. Then you've got a series of prisms, which um, basically bring the, the image to all that light to focus to form an image. And then at the back you've got an eyepiece, which magnifies the image. And you've got two different types of binoculars. You've got roof binoculars and porio binoculars. These roof binoculars um, have a straight through configuration. So the light passes straight through them. Well, uh, with the poro binoculars, you have a series of prisms which folds the light path, which makes the binoculars uh, more compact. The advantage of that is you can take very large binoculars, basically fold them down to make them more readily portable and easy to use. Porio, problems, um, porio uh, binoculars are mostly used for astronomy because in astronomy, you want big aperture, big, uh, big aperture binoculars, one with large objectives, which gather lots of light, now to see very faint objects. At the same time, you want to make want them be able to actually use them to actually small enough to handhold the porio binoculars with their folded light path gives us that um, advantage. But binoculars are rated according to two numbers. You get the magnification and the, the diameter of the objective lens. For example, if you have a pair of 10 times 50s, that means the objective lens is 50 millimeters in diameter. The magnification is times 10. But something else you have to think about um, binoculars is um, the exit pupil. So the light that comes out of the eyepiece is like a pencil beam of light. The exit pupil is like the diameter of that exit pupil. When you get into the night sky, when you go into, out into the dark, your eye, your eye dilates and the diameter of your um, dilated iris is about five to seven millimeters in diameter. So ideally you want the exit pupil matches that because if the exit pupil is too large, then some of that light falls on your iris and cornea. That doesn't go into your eye. So it's basically the light is wasted. Conversely, if the exit pupil is too narrow, you're not getting as much light into eye as you would have done. So again, you uh, struggle to see faint objects. Um, so binoculars, pair of say 10 times 50s, which is typical binoculars most amateurs use, they would have an exit pupil of five millimeters. That's usually ideal because only a child's eye would actually dilute the full seven millimeters. Once you hit sort of early to mid twenties, your eyes only go to late to about five millimeters. So exit pupil of five millimeters is um, ideal in, in many ways. We also have to think about eye relief. That's the distance you have to place your eye behind the lens in order to see the entire field of view. And eye relief is important if you had to wear glasses when observing, because if you're just um, short-sighted or long-sighted, you can just readjust the focus to uh, bring the object into, in, in, image into focus. But if you suffer from something like, that, something like astigmatism, and you had to wear glasses during observing, then you had to think about the eye relief, and whether it's actually possible to look through the binoculars with your glasses. Um, how much eye relief you're going to get with a pair of binoculars is going to depend greatly on the, the make and model. So it's probably a good idea rather than buy a pair of binoculars online and hope for the best, but actually try and use, go to a shop and actually buy a binoculars there. Then you can actually use the 
you try the binoculars out before you purchase and see whether they give you a suitable amount of uh, eye relief. But which binoculars are best for you? Well, it's important to stress that any pair of binoculars you already own will be, could be used for astronomy. So you don't necessarily have to go out and buy a special pair of binoculars just to serve the night sky. Uh, the image on the left here, they're a pair of um, 8x42s and they're roof prisms because you see they have this straight through configuration. And they're typically sold um, for bird watching and other such activities. If you already own such a pair of binoculars, they'd be fine for astronomy. But I would say that probably a pair of 8x40s is probably the smallest pair of binoculars you can sensibly use for astronomy. It's again with astronomy because we're looking at such faint objects, we really need large objective lens so we can gather plenty of light. And um, any binoculars smaller than 8 times 40 is probably maybe too small to use. Though they would have the advantage of being very um, light, easy to hand hold, also having very wide fields of view, which may be a suitable for you know, scanning star fields. On the right here, we've got a pair of 10 times 50s, which are typical amateur binoculars. And again, they give you more, because uh, they have a large object, they make it easier to see faint objects. You also have the advantage of being having a slightly higher magnification, which makes them which darkens the night sky, makes it easier to see faint stars. That's of course particularly important if you're observing from light polluted skies, which most uh, amateurs are. Of course, the problem is that as binoculars get bigger, they get heavier and easier to handhold. So, um, how big a pair of binoculars you can sensibly handhold will obviously depend on your personal circumstances. Um, very young people or more elderly people, if anyone lacks um, upper body strength or lacks a strength grip or strength has strong arms, you know, may struggle to, um, to hold a really heavy pair of binoculars. Um, that's important to point out that um, observing with binoculars is a lot easier if you sit down. Ideally, you want something like a garden chair or kind of which has armrests, so then you can rest your elbows on the, on the armrests and that will help steady the binoculars. But if you want, um, you want even bigger pair of binoculars like these ones here, which are 20 times 80s, then you're probably going to have to want to mount them on a tripod. Um, it would depend. Some people can. It would depend on the exact make and model of binoculars, which would determine the exact weight. I mean, some people may be able to hold a pair of binoculars of that size, but at least for short periods of time. But I imagine most people probably want to um, mount them on a tripod of some sort. You can get adapters which allow you to mount your, your binoculars on a camera tripod. That doesn't tend to be very um, ergonomic because the binoculars aren't, the tripod isn't very high. And you have to sort of sit down and squat down to get underneath your binoculars and you just have to crane your neck at a weird angle. You can buy a, what they call um, parallelogram mounts, which again is designed to be more designed specifically for astronomy and designed to be uh, more ergonomic, but they can be um, quite expensive. And this uh, mount here, as you see, has this bar on it so that's designed to attach it to a parallelogram mount. But um, I'd say I personally never used a tripod with a pair of binoculars. To me, it sort of flies in the spirit of uh, binocular observing. So I want, um, I don't want to mess around sort of setting up equipment. I like the idea of just grabbing a pair of binoculars, going outside, observing the night sky, then come back in again. But um, if you're going to go to the hassle, I think, of setting up a, uh, a, pair of, a tripod for a pair of binoculars, you're better off using a telescope. But some, all people are different. Some people are happy to use tripod mounted binoculars. Of course, when binoculars get very big, you have to mount them on a tripod. I mean, these are the largest binoculars I think you can buy in the UK. They're a pair of, uh, I think, 2500s. So they have an object lens 100 millimeters, that's four inches in diameter. And you see, they come on their own tripod as well, because uh, that's a sort of fork shaped mount. Again, there's no way you're going to handhold the binoculars that big. The biggest binoculars in production, I think, are these ones here, which are a pair of, I think, 50 times 150s. So again, they have drip the lenses, uh, 150 millimeters or six inches in diameter. Again, you can see they come on their own mountain tripod. Um, of course, one way, to, uh, unfortunately, this photo doesn't really give you a sense of scale. It's hard to see which is the bigger binoculars, but showing this photograph here, you can give an idea of just how big these binoculars are. And you see how this person actually um, engineered a sort of neat solution to how to hold the binoculars in ergonomically. So yeah, a special chair is made which um, rotates round and tilt back and forth so you can point at any point in the night sky. So if there are any uh, budding engineers out there you're looking for a project, it's an inspiration for you. But what you can see with the binoculars, well, within the solar system, you can see the sun, 
So we should say um, the sun, of course, is a very dangerous object to look at. You should even staring at the sun with the naked eye could damage your eyesight, and you should never look at the sun through an unfiltered instrument, because if you look at the glance of the sun through telescope and binoculars, it will blind you instantaneously. It is possible to observe the sun uh, safely through binoculars, as we'll see. You can see the moon. You see, um, you, one of the things you can't see with binoculars is, is surface detail planets, but the, you can study the planets in slightly more detail with binoculars. And you can observe asteroids and you can observe comets with um, binoculars. So the safest way is to observe the sun with a pair of binoculars is to project the image onto a piece of card. This diagram gives um, sort of quite an elaborate setup. You've got binoculars mounted on a tripod there. You've got a piece of card. One of the lenses, of course, covered up so you don't get two images. And that's also for reasons of safety, so you don't inadvertently burn yourself. But then, you, um, then the image is projected onto this piece of card here, and that, that card there is just to um, cast a shadow, so you can see a more high contrast image. And there's the picture here, which gives you a sort of more rough and ready way of observing the sun. You just hand hold the binoculars. Again, you need to keep the cap on one side, but you can just project the image onto a piece of card or onto a wall or any you know, convenient sort of surface. This way, you can actually um, observe sunspots on the solar surface. So sunspots are some magnetic storms that appear on the solar surface. They usually um, experience dark spots. But you can also see the, a partial solar eclipse as well. So when the moon passes in front of the sun, it will partly obscure it. And uh, you can safely um, observe the partial phases of eclipse just with a simple pair of binoculars. Um, back in, I think it was in the summer of 1984, I saw my first partial solar eclipse. And I actually, that's how I observed it. Actually, I had a small pair of binoculars. And I used it to project the image of the sun onto a piece of card. And that photograph there again sort of illustrates how it works in real life. So again, you've got a pair of binoculars and a trod, and you've got a piece of card with a suitable shadow, and you can see that you can easily project a nice big image of the sun onto a, a white coloured surface. That would be the perfect way to, I think, to observe a total solar eclipse. If you were travelling to the other side of the planet to see a total solar eclipse, rather than bring a telescope with you, you'd be better off just with a pair of binoculars. So you can observe uh, so the, part, the partial phases of the like that. And when it came to the talent, it also used the binoculars to observe the corona, which is the outer layer, because um, something the photographs like this don't actually show is that the corona is actually um, constantly moving. Then you can actually see like uh, flames flickering in the fire. You can actually see that with binoculars. So it's something about if you get a chance to see a total solar eclipse. I, mean, I personally never seen a total solar eclipse, but I think if I ever got the chance to travel to see one, I would definitely take binoculars with me because it was so much easier than going to Hassel was actually trying to transport a telescope to somewhere. Of course, you can see the moon. The, mo the moon is a fascinating object to look at, whether you're examining it with a naked eye, binoculars, or a small telescope. There's a huge range of um, details you can see just with uh, naked eye or with binoculars. And you can buy uh, maps which allow you to explore the moon and identify all these features. And that's a very rewarding thing to do, to actually um, explore the moon in a very systematic way, and actually learn your way around the moon, identifying all the various um, craters and seas and so forth. So for example, here we've got the Sea of Tranquilities where the Apollo astronauts landed, Apollo 11 astronauts landed. You've got these bright ray craters like Tycho and Copernicus. They're the younger craters on the moon because they have these uh, rays emanating from them, which is, um, materials that's been thrown up over the lunar surface when they're doing the uh, impact that formed these craters. There's other features as well. For example, you can see um, mountain ranges on the moon. That's here. And some of the other um, the range of other craters as well. Yeah, there's dozens of objects you can see on the moon just with a simple pair of binoculars. And uh, charts like this can be freely downloaded from the internet. If you look at the, uh, the APS um, SPA website, you see there's um, they have a lunar uh, uh, section. And they'll give you advice on how to identify and draw uh, objects, uh, features on the moon, even if you've got just a simple pair of binoculars. You can also view uh, total lunar eclipse. That's something that's visible just with the naked eye with binoculars. The lunar eclipse is when the moon passes into the shadow. It slowly starts to disappear until it reaches the umbra, the central part of the shadow, then it low red because all the red light from the sun is able to diffract through the Earth's uh, atmosphere and illuminate the moon. So it never completely disappears. It turns to sort of rud ruddish coppery colour. That's something that's, again, best viewed with the naked eye or with a simple pair of binoculars. 
And when it comes to the planets, as they show detail on the planetary surfaces, um, it might be possible to see the phases of Venus, because Mercury and Venus are what called inferior planets, because they're nearer to the Sun than the Earth is. And both uh, Mercury and Venus do show phases, like the Moon. It has been reported that you know, people can actually see the phases when um, the phases of Venus with the naked eye. So when um, Venus is at the crescent phase, it's actually at the nearest point of the Earth, so it has the largest apparent diameter. But it's again, it should be possible to see the crescent phase of the Moon with a pair of binoculars if they're suitably mounted. What something you can see is um, the moons of Jupiter. So Jupiter has about, I think it's about 60 odd satellites, which of them are captured asteroids and comets, but it has four major satellites, four regular satellites. Technically called the Galileans, because those are called by Galileo in 1610. Individually they're called Ganymede, Europa, Io, and Callisto. But they all should be visible in a simple pair of 10 times 50 binoculars. They appear as little stars either side of Jupiter. And you, have, you can watch them as they move around the planet over the course of a few hours. But again, you probably have to have your binoculars either tripod mounted or perhaps um, steadied on some sort of support. I find that if you just rest your elbows on a windowsill or or garden walls, other convenient surface, that will steady the view enough for you to actually pick out the, the Galilean satellites. But looking further out of the solar system, you can see Uranus. Uranus is about the sixth magnitude, sixth magnitude so it's probably not going to be visible with the naked eye unless you have very good eyesight and very dark skies, but it's easily seen in binoculars. This picture here shows its current position in the night sky, it's just in the constellation of Aries. And what you can do is you can actually um, use a uh, program such as Stellarium to go to a very detailed um, chart of the area around Uranus. And what you can do is either attempt to pick out Uranus itself using this star chart. It often appears just as a faint star. Or what you can do is then sketch that, that um, area of the sky and you watch the Uranus as it moves slowly over the course of a few weeks. Like this, you can do the same for Neptune as well. Neptune is about the eighth magnitude, so again, it's going to be um, too faint to see with the naked eye, but it should be easily seen with a small pair of binoculars. As in uh, just under, as in the constellation of um, Aquarius at the moment. But again, if you uh, use something like stellar rare and use a detailed star chart, you, can, you should be able to pick up Neptune. And again, if you wish, you can sketch that star that star field through binoculars, and then come back up in a few uh, weeks' time and see how Neptune's actually moved slowly during that time. But another thing you can see is asteroids. I mean, asteroids, again, will appear nothing more than faint stars. But again, you can tell they're asteroids by virtue of the fact they will move slowly over the course of um, a few days, weeks, or months. The image to the right here shows us a chart for the asteroid Pallas, which is currently visible not far from uh, Neptune in the sort of southeastern sky. It's about the ninth magnitude at the moment, so it should be faintly visible in a pair of 10 times 50s. It should be easily visible in. Um, a much larger pair of binoculars, but this chart shows how it's slowly moving over the course of the next few months. And again, you can, if you have a detailed star chart of that region, you should be able to pick up Pallias amongst the background stars. Or again, you can just sketch that star field and observe, pick Pallias, Pallias out by the fact that it will be slowly moving from night to night. If you want a um, slightly easier challenge, you can look at the you can look at Ceres. Ceres um, exists within the asteroid belt between Mars and Jupiter. We used to think it was um, one of the largest asteroids, but now it's been redesignated as a minor planet. It's actually large enough to um, put itself into a spiral shape. It's a diameter, diameter, I think, about 500 kilometers. But that's about the sixth magnitude, and it's easily visible in um, Taurus at the moment. That's the bright star dead from there. So again, you should, if you've got a detailed star chart, you can actually pick that out. Or indeed, again, sketch the star field, and then watch Sirius as it slowly moves from night to night, week to week. So when you think, of, if you know something about astronomy, you think of um, minor planets, you often think about the minor planets that exist outside the, out on the Kuiper belt, on the edge of the solar system. So you think of Pluto, or Maki Maki, Eris, but um, you usually assume that things can't be seen. You have a very big telescope and possibly uh, you have a CCC camera as well. But um, Sirius yeah, is actually a minor planet you can easily see just with a simple pair of binoculars. And the signal to use that would be visible even a very small pair of binoculars, even from uh, light polluted skies. And you can see comets as well. I mean, comets are often referred to as dirty snowballs. They're relatively small, irregular lumps of rock and ice that 
usually exist outside in the outer solar system, the basic debris left over from the formation of the outer solar system. But really, logically, they will fall into the sun. As they do that, as they do so, that ice will sublimate, will turn directly into a gas, and then that gas will be pushed away from the complete nucleus by the solar wind. The stream of charged particles emanates out from the sun in all directions, using these um, fantastic tails, which also always point away from the sun. I mean, comets themselves are reasonably common, though they tend to be very small and very faint, and they're interesting to advanced amateurs who specialise in cometary observing and have a big telescope and CCD cameras. But every year, if you're lucky, you can see a comet that's bright enough to be seen, either with binoculars or a naked eye. Um, for example, here, this that's a comet uh, Hill Bop. That was visible with a naked eye for um, quite a number of months in the 1990s. And that was actually a sort of glorious sight of binoculars. And binoculars are really the best things to observe um, comets with because the comets, are, of course, they're like this extended objects. So you need the wide fields of view of binoculars, binoculars, you know, to see the comet in its all its glory. I mean, yeah, you could point a telescope at the nucleus of the comet and study that in detail, but see a comet for what it is, you really need the wide field view of binoculars. And that's a um, photograph of um, Comet Neowise, which came was visible, I think, last summer, July time. I mean, that was um, the best seen in binoculars. This is a comet, uh, I think it's Comet Lovejoy, which is visible in 2015, that green fuzzy spot there. And that shows you that all comets have a tail, not all comets have a tail we can see, because sometimes the tail is pointing away from us. But that was, again, the best seen with binoculars because it was um, a relatively sort of large object. It would have been um, best seen with low powers, which um, helped concentrate the light spike into a small area, so it makes it easier to see. Just moving away from the solar system, stars themselves. You can see colored stars, you can see double stars, you can see variable stars. And um, this is an image of uh, Orion, and it shows um, the different colored stars here. You've got Betelgeuse, also known as Be Betelgeuse. That was in the news of um, last year, year four last, because it unexpectedly faded. That's a red supergiant. You can see a distinctive orange color is actually um, can be seen with the naked eye, but um, the colors are best seen with binoculars to help bring the, those colors out. In contrast, you've got Rigel here, which is um, a white star. And the colors of the stars actually represent the temperatures of the stars, because these red stars here are the cool stars. They used to have surface temperatures about two or 3,000 degrees. Well by, well, by comparison, these white stars, you often surface temperatures of 40,000, 50,000 degrees. But uh, yeah, the other thing you can see, of course, is double stars. And these stars, which, um, well, some stars are just lines, double stars on the line of sight, so they're what we call optical doubles. And a lot of uh, double stars, you see doubles, they're just stars that happen to be appear close together in the night sky. But some double stars are actually gravitationally bound together, so they orbit around their common center of gravity, just like the Earth and Moon and orbit around their common center of gravity. Double stars, as we said, probably visible through um, telescope application scope to resolve or separate the two stars, but a uh, number can be uh, seen. To but next, of course, you've got variable stars, which is what I specialize in observing in. Variable stars, as the name implies, basically um, stars that vary in brightness. And you've basically got two forms of variable stars, variables. The asteristic variables are called eclipsing binaries. That's what this certain uh, gift shows. You've got two stars, again, all in their common center, it's a very small, bright star. My stars. Will be so together that the shift becomes apparent when the larger faint, larger faint star in front of its smaller, brighter companion, and the this apparently star drops in brightness. And it's possible to brightness and make it by all the binoculars. Apparently, you have uh, interest variables, also variables that stars expand and contracting. As they get bigger, they get fainter. As they get smaller, they get brighter again. Emanation of um, which is a long period um, variable in uh, Cetus. Amber is that the um, very first uh, variable star. Um, good. That they probably some of them may just with the noctis. He's um, usually red giants or super giants. Stars, but the way you observe them. 
what stars are charts such as this is a star chart from the SBA program, AF uh, signing in. And then according to the convention, the variable stars are also drawn as a point with a circle around them. And you see there's various uh, stars here, followed by letters, the comparison stars. So they're non-variable stars, but stars for which magnitude precisely. This is what you compare the variable star with the comparison stars in order to estimate how bright the variable star is. For example, you may observe that a yes, sign is uh, fainter than a star e, but brighter than g. So that would put it somewhere between magnitude 6.9 and 7.2. And then you see, you try and, es try and estimate just where it is between those two um, comparisons. I suppose it's a knowledge of the way that if you are uh, bring a piece of wood with a ruler, and that ruler only shows centimeter divisions, so it didn't show any millimeter millimeter divisions, you could observe that the piece of wood is sort of 10 and something centimeters long. So then you estimate just how much more, how, you see, look at it and say, well, how close is it closer to 11 centimeters? It's close to 10 centimeters, it's halfway between. And that way, you see, you can maybe have to estimate that maybe it's more like 10 and a half centimeters long, something like that. And we do the same thing with stars. You can use what we call the fractional method. When you say, well, this variable star is sort of halfway between two pairs of stars, you say a quarter fainter than uh, uh, the, this uh, comparison star. Or we can use the step method where you divide the difference between stars into tenths of magnitude. And again, you say this star is two tenths of a um, magnitude, so magnitude brighter than this other star. Now, it doesn't really matter which way I uh, use the function, this will mix and match um, methodologies, but the important thing is basically just uh, try and estimate the brightness of the star by comparing it to two stars of similar brightness, one which is brighter, one which is fainter. And when you make enough observations over a such long period of time, you build up um, a light curve for the star, which is a very, shows how the star has varied in brightness over the course time. That's a light curve of the SPS over the year. That's the light curve of VSA major, which is a semi-regular variable in the constellation of the Great Bear. And we can see how the stars vary over time. That's how there are hundreds of thousands of variable stars in the galaxy. And of course, professional observers can't observe them all. So they're uh, dependent on amateurs actually making these kind of observations. We're the only people who actually observe these stars and record what they do. So that's one way in making scientific use of patients or star observing is a way to make those observations just with uh, either the naked eye or a simple pair of binoculars. I mean, I do all my variable star observing just with the naked eye or a simple pair of binoculars. I have about 100 I observe, some for the SBA, some for the British Astronomical Association. But I do all my observing just with the binoculars. So you don't need to telescope to those, those kinds of scientifically useful observations. Looking out into the deep sky, I mean, you've got a range of objects you can see. You see um, star clusters, nebula, galaxies. I mean, these are objects which are often best seen with binoculars. Again, the advantage of um, binoculars because they have these low powers and very wide fields of view. They are ideal for viewing um, very objects which have a very large apparent size called extended objects. For example, here, this is a photograph of um, looking towards a Taurus. And see the constellation uh, open star cluster there called the Pleiades or Seven Sisters. And that's so big, it's best seen with a pair of binoculars. You point a telescope towards that, you never get all the stars in the same field of view. So to see the star cluster in glory, you really need uh, to view through a pair of binoculars. Likewise, um, down here, you've got the bright star of Debrum. And there's another star cluster here called um, the Heidi star cluster. And again, that's best seen with binoculars. It's just so big and covers such a large area of sky, you're never going to see it all in the, the limited field of view of um, a telescope. But um, you can also see nebula, that's a photograph of the Orion nebula, which is visible with the naked eye, again, visible with a pair of binoculars. Of course, these deep sky objects don't um, look anything like that when you, when you look at them through a binoculars or a telescope, because you're looking at things that are very small and very faint. They, they don't show any colour and they often show up just as small misty blobs of light. But you have to bear in mind, I mean, you're looking at an object that's hundreds, thousands, possibly millions of light. You know, deep sky observing is probably is sort of those things you do with the mind as much as the eye. It's known what you're looking at and be able to appreciate what you're looking at, which makes um, these objects a fascinating thing to discover on your own, view your own eyes. 
And of course, you can see, you can see other galaxies as well, just through binoculars. I mean, that's the image of a M31, the Andromeda galaxy. That's actually visible with the naked eye. And again, though, again, it's one of those objects the best seen with binoculars because when you have binoculars, can you see it's its entirety in the night sky? Yeah, I mean, you can point a telescope at it and point and examine some of it in more detail, but to see it for what it is in its entirety, you need, really need the wide field view of binoculars. So here it gives a um, screenshot from Stellarium, it's a planetarium software. And it shows you um, some idea of what's invisible in the night sky at this time of the year, about half past eight. So if you're looking west here and you're seeing the spring constellation of the Booties and Corona Borealis setting. Corona Borealis contains um, a couple of variable stars which can be seen with binoculars. You've got um, our Corona Borealis, which is um, often referred to as the sooty star. It usually shines about the sixth magnitude, but every so often, every few years, it will suddenly drop to about magnitude 15. So what happens is that the carbon builds up in the star's atmosphere. And periodically, the carbon builds up to the extent it blocks all the light from the stars, causing this abrupt brightness. We haven't seen um, our Corona Borealis um, experience these drop, this abrupt drop in brightness for quite some number of years now. So it's an interesting star to keep an eye on because it will be interesting to see um, when it next uh, fades. Equally, of course, um, you've got nearby, you've got um, T Corona Borealis, which is a reoccurring nova. That's basically the opposite of our Corona Borealis because um, periodically it goes, um, it um, creates a massive uh, increases in brightness. It first um, showed an increase in brightness in 1866 and again in 1946, it became visible with the naked eye. Normally, because it's very, very faint, normally it's about 11th magnitude. So you need either, either a large pair of binoculars or a small telescope to see it, but it's been known to increase the second magnitude. And of course, we don't know whether it will ever increase in brightness again. It might or may not, but again, it's one of those interesting things to keep an eye on. Then here you got the constellation of Hercules, and then you've got the Great Gob of the Custer. Which again is visible easily seen with binoculars, some misty patch of light. So open um go over the clusters, that's basically a spherical distribution of stars. You've got something like I think three hundred thousand stars all crammed into a board about 160 light years across. That was first discovered by the Mentali in, in 1714. But if you have very dark skies, you might be able to see it with the naked eye as he did, but it's certainly easily seen in binoculars. And above there you've got M92, which is another gobble cluster. Again, that could be seen. In binoculars as well. These are been, both got um, the clusters are actually quite remote. I think that one's about, uh, I think it's about something like 35,000 light years away. This is about 22,000 light years away. Because the clusters form sort of a halo around our own galaxy. So that they're far this more distant than the usual deep sky objects you see in the night sky. Up here, we've got us a Vija. And then there's an interesting uh, double star just sort of here by Vija, which is Epsilon. Lyra, also known as Double Double. If you have very good eyesight, you can actually see the Epsilon. There is a double star. But if, um, it's easily seen splitting binoculars. But if you look at each of those stars with a through a telescope, you see each of those stars themselves double. So you have two stars orbiting the common center, the other two stars orbiting their common center of gravity, but both pairs then orbiting their common center of gravity as well. And because then this star here, which is Beta Lyra, that's another interesting variable star. So that's um it varies between I think magnitude 3.4, 4.3 over course of about 13 days. And these stars are uh, they're basically eclipsing binary, but they're also an example of um, a contact binary because they're they're so close together they're almost touching, they're only about 35,000 like a uh, thousand kilometers apart. They're so close together that their mutual gravitational pull is actually distorting them into an egg shape. There's a constant exchange of material um, between them as well. So that creates a very complex situation, a very complicated light changes. But they, you can actually see um, beta there change in brightness over the course of a few days just with the naked eye. Looking here, we've got the, the summer Milky Way. So when you look at the Milky Way, you're looking at um, along the plane of the, of the galaxy. So you're seeing this rich concentration of stars and nebula and other things that make up our galaxy. So that's an um, excellent thing to sweep with, an, with binoculars because you see all these rich star fields. You have very dark skies. You see the Milky Way passing overhead. You can actually see a lot of detail in the eye. For example, you can see the dark rift in the Sinus, which is a um, large molecular cloud, which um, blocks out the lines of holding the heavens, as um, William Herschel called it. But the Milky Way, again, is best examined with binoculars because, again, you get these low powers, very wide fields of view. So, again, you see all these rich star fields. Here in, in the constellation of the shield, you've got the wild duck cluster, which is um, 
basically with their binoculars through the little cluster of stars. And looking to the north, again, you've got the, uh, the plow here. And there's some, uh, just I think it's about here, you've got a couple of uh, galaxies, M81 and M82, which are, again can be seen in binoculars. If you, um, you've got dark enough skies, then you've got Mitzra as well, which is again a double star, which is easily split with binoculars. You follow the, these stars here that points out to Polaris. You can see Polaris with um, the binoculars, you can see it's actually um, it's a ring of faint stars around it. It's often called the engagement ring. So you see it's like a ring of stars and the Polaris is like the diamond on the ring. That's an example of um, what we call an asterism or pattern of stars. And then by the joints of binocular observing, if you, get to, if you scan the night sky, you see all these um, and random pants stars, you can see, see patterns into them. But then looking here to the east, again, you've got the other half of the Milky Way. Again, that's a very rich um, field to, to scan with binoculars because they see all these rich star fields. Um, in um, Algeria, the shield, there's loads of um, open stars, so which you can see with binoculars, the small you know, misty patches of light. Up in Perseus, again, that's a lot of rich star fields there. That's um, Alpha Perseus, and around there, there's um, a collection of stars called the Alpha Perseus Association, and also called the OB Association because they're made up of um, stars which have the special classification of OB. So they're very bright, very luminous, very massive stars. But that is, um, that's you know, in areas you want to sweep binoculars because you pick out all these bright stars. Here you've got Algolia, which is um, the first eclipse in binary ever discovered. And you can follow um, the, the ch that changes in brightness over the course of whenever it goes into eclipse just with the naked eye. Now here you've got the double cluster, which again is another, um, also known as the sword handle. That's another thing that's best seen in binoculars. Is this misty pet in the night sky. Up here you've got Cassiopeia. So again, it's a good constellation to sweep with binoculars because again, it's, it's all with rich star fields and open clusters. That's the owl cluster and then 52. Here you're looking south again, you've got the summer constellation, the sign was the swan. And that's again along the summer Milky Way. So that's a very good constellation to sweep just with binoculars because again, you've got all these rich star fields and all these open clusters like M39. You've got very dark skies. You can actually see, also see a mission nebula here called the North American Nebula. That should be being best seen in binoculars because again, it um, has a very large apparent diameter and they have very low surface um, brightness. So again, you need the low powers of binoculars to see it properly. Then we look uh, to the east, you see the constellation of Pegasus rising here, the great square of Pegasus there, and the constellation of um, Andromeda, which contains the famous of the Andromeda galaxy. If you have reasonably dark skies, that's visible with the naked eye, and it's certainly easy to see with binoculars. The best way to find it is to identify the square of Pegasus. All these lines down, which the, the constellation uh, does make up the constellation of Andromeda, and then sort of follow these lots, faint line stars up. Alternatively, you can use Cassiopeia. This big W in the sky, you use these stars here as an arrow pointing down to the Andromeda galaxy. There's another um, galaxy here called um, M33, or the Pinwheel Galaxy in Triangle. Them. That's also visible with birds if you have dark enough skies. I can just about see that in my um, light blue skies with my 10 times 50s. So that's um, the Andromeda galaxy is the nearest object you see with the naked eye. It's about two and a half million light years away. In comparison, M33 is five and a half million light years away. So hopefully that's given you some idea of what you see just with a simple pair of binoculars. There's some additional resources if you want uh, to say, you know, study the subject further. There's some books there you can read. Um, it's also worth noting that Sky Night magazine does do a binocular tour written by Steve a Token. So if you buy that magazine, it will show you um, what you see with binoculars on every given month. And also you follow this link here. There's actually um, a guide to buying uh, budget binoculars. They're the best box is for by for uh, under 100 pounds, I think it is. So I'll stop sharing now. Let's see if there's any questions. Thank you very much, Matthew. Very, uh, very interesting presentation. And and yes, there has been some uh, reaction in the chat. So um, so Sheila says, not a question, but on 8th of June 2004, she walked around Godalming, near, near to us actually, uh, carrying her 10 by 50s and a sheet of paper on which she projected, projected the transit of Venus, um, and people were really impressed. So, um, so of course, yeah, uh, well, yeah. Uh, have lots of amazing uses, yeah. Um, and then Catherine Grimes says she tried using 10 by 50 binoculars and found the camera shake made it difficult to view the sky for her. 
uh, tripod was awkward, but she now uses 10 by 30 image stabilized binoculars. And that's right. good. Um, so that's... Yeah. There's something you could try. Yeah, they're more expensive than regular binoculars, but yeah, they can help you out if you have trouble, you know, holding binoculars, you know, still. Yes, and uh, and Jeff um, says Jeff Winterman says, do you think image stabilized binoculars are worth the money? <laughs> I've never used them myself. I mean, I suppose it depends really what, um, how um, it depends how difficult you find holding binoculars. I mean, I was have no problem holding my binoculars still, so I don't feel the need to buy them, but. Um, I know a lot of people say good things about them. They're particularly good if you want um, to see faint objects. Because that's one of the problems of holding, uh, trying to handhold binoculars because the image shape can actually make it hard to see faint stars. But you may feel see, to see more if the uh, image is stabilised. And of course, you do waive the hassle of having a, a tripod as well. So yeah, I mean, if you can afford them, maybe worth looking into. Yeah. The possibility. Um, and uh, Jim Roberts says, thank you very much. Very interesting. Uh, another one from Tim. So great presentation. Thank you. Recently brought a pair of 2 by 50 wide field Orion constellation binoculars. Found they provide views as if in the darkest sky site and also restore vision to what it used to be when younger. Have you any experience with these or thoughts on them? Um, I've tried one of those binoculars uh, once, yeah, uh, some I know in my society had to pair and I did try them out, they're actually a lot of fun to use actually, yes, um, they're probably very good, um, you probably need to use them from very dark skies, but there's no light pollution, that's I think where you get the best out of them, they'd be good for things like scanning the Milky Way, but uh, for more uh, detailed studies like variable star that you probably need the higher magnification of uh, regular binoculars. Excellent, thank you very much. So I can't see any other, oh, hang on, just a comment. Steve Con Tonkin says to swap hands when holding heavier binoculars. So cross your arms at the wrist and hold at the left side with the right side and vice versa. I find that helps, interesting. Right. Possibility. Tip, yeah. yeah. Uh, and could see the moons of Jupiter from the center of Damascus with my IS binoculars, uh, says Catherine Grant. Okay, so thank you very much again. Um, really interesting talk and wide range all the way from a lovely tour of the night sky as well. So that's, uh, that's wonderful. Um, thank you very much. Um, I think that's probably all the comments. And um, so thank you again. And um, just to say, um, uh, apologies to, uh, I realised that I missed a couple of questions at the end of Susie's talk, so I've, I've passed a couple actually on to, on to Susie, so hopefully we'll get an answer on, on a couple of those. Um, and um, just to wrap up the meeting this afternoon, to say thank you very much again to all the presenters um, this afternoon. Um, great meeting again. And um, so the next one will be end of January, so 30th of January, and uh, the main talk there will be my colleague, Professor Geraint Jones from UCL's Mars Space Science Lab, who will be talking about Comet Interceptor. And actually, he has done some scientific work um, using images from, um, from amateur astronomers as well, so hopefully he'll, he'll mention a bit of that too. Um, so thank you very much again. Um, and uh, Robin, not sure if there's anything else you want to add? Uh, no, I think that's that's fine. Uh, just to say that in case anybody has missed the announcement that the <clears throat> April, sorry, the January meeting we had hoped to hold at the Institute of Physics uh, and that was uh, planned, but nothing to do with COVID at all, but they have told us that the building is being refurbished. So that meeting will have to be held online. It, we, we can't really, uh, well, two things. We, we can't really reorganize a meeting at, at a very short notice, so a meeting the size of the SPA's meeting. And also, well, none of us really knows what's going to happen in January. So um, we, it, the, the decision has been to, to hold that online, but we have every hope of holding the next April meeting online. And uh, also, let me just remind folk of the, the, the uh, if, if you want to have a, a day of astronomy, at this time of year, back in, in, in November, back in previous years, we've held the, uh, a, a, re a weekend residential course at Preston Montford in Shropshire. And this year and last year, we haven't been able to do this for the reasons of COVID because it takes, as I said, you, you, you can't organize these things at short notice. We need to, uh, we need to have chosen our venue well in advance. And it was too great a risk to know what would happen in the future. Uh, we couldn't predict back in June and July when we needed to book the place. 
that, that we would be able to hold the meeting. So that's why we decided not to after a lot of discussion. However, we are going to hold an online uh, virtual Preston Montford, and it's going to be starring uh, Ian Morrison, Martin Lewis and Lee Fletcher. And so we will be looking at observing the planets. I will be there as well. And so every member is very welcome to attend. It will be a Zoom meeting. So uh, unlike a, a, this, which is a webinar, you will actually be able to see and interact with other members. Uh, so that will be quite fun. And we hope to see a lot of you there. And also welcome to a new member. I think it's John Braithwaite who joined as a result of seeing this Zoom meeting. So welcome to you. Excellent. Thank you very much. And um, yeah, thanks again to all the speakers this afternoon and um, and also to Dave Eagle, who has kept the Zoom going very well and um, and uh, everything uh, worked extremely well. So thank you all and uh, see you next time.